there, everyone. My name is Pirak Jithani. I am actually a internal medicine resident at Stanford. And today I'm going to go over the ICU fundamentals for interns. I never did an ICU rotation in medical school. So when I started ICU, it was actually very overwhelming. Um, and I feel like this uh, video is something that would have really helped me. And so I went ahead and created this all for you uh, in the hopes that it helps you and uh, you're more prepared. So what is an ICU? An ICU in any hospital means intensive care unit, and it usually is for patients who require a higher level of care than might be available traditionally on the floor. This might be a for, for a variety of reasons, but for example, you might need to monitor vital signs more aggressively. Someone with an intracranial hemorrhage or someone who you're concerned about bleeding into their brain might need to have neuro checks every hour or so. If someone is intubated and is on a ventilator, they often need to have um, a ventilator uh, respiratory therapist, as well as a nurse who is familiar with the ventilator settings, and that often is only in the ICU. Similarly, you might also have unique hemodynamics for patients who have septic shock. Uh, they often have very, very low blood pressures, and therefore we need to give them additional medications such as pressors to make sure that they're okay. And um, when we need to give these pressors, that can often only be done in an ICU setting because um, those are the individuals who are trained to give those pressors. You can't give pressors on the floor because they're often continuous and they often need to be titrated to a patient's blood pressure to ensure that they're perfusing um, their body. So with that being said, an ICU patient is very, very complex because oftentimes they might be intubated. They might need to have multiple pressors. They might need to have vital signs checked pretty regularly. They might have chest tubes. They might have Foley catheters. And so you need to make sure you understand all of those things. And to make sure you understand all of those things, we like to break things down by system. What I mean by system is um, individuals um, are thought about based on their brain based on their respiratory status, based on their heart, based on their GI status, based on their kidney status. We don't just think about one individual problem. We think about every single system and that makes sure you don't forget anything. So here's like a general overarching way of kind of breaking this down. And I included an image here just so you know what I mean. When you think about a patient in terms of their system, and you have to do this for every single ICU patient, and it's pretty much true across most ICUs, most ICUs will require you to think about patients from the system standpoint, so you don't forget anything. You start with the neurologics, you start with their mental status, you start with if they're on any sedating meds, you then go down to the heart and lungs, you then talk a bit about their GI tract, if there's any issues there, you talk about their kidneys, you talk about their skin, you talk about any infections they might have, you might even also talk about their heme standpoint, if they have anemia, leukocytosis, all of those things. So that's the general format. And today I'm actually gonna walk you through how I would approach um, addressing of an ICU patient and how to make sure you don't miss anything. Because I think that's the biggest thing. If you don't miss anything, you can slowly start getting better at gathering the data and from there formulating a plan for these individuals who can be very, very sick. So um, the basics are still very much the same. In the ICU, you still want to always start with a one-liner. You know, who is this patient? Uh, what are they ultimately here for? And ultimately, the biggest thing that you need to include in the ICU is what are their um, ICU needs. Why are they in the ICU? Why couldn't they just be on a floor? Are they on? Are they in septic shock, refractory to multiple pressors? Are they on a ventilator requiring to be uh, vented pretty regularly because they can't breathe on their own? Are they on neuro checks, right? Um, and the formula for a good one-liner is always, you know, the name, the age, the gender, and then you also want to include three parts of their past medical history that you think are the most relevant, and then three parts of their HPI. Maybe they came in with sharp supersternal uh, chest pain that was concerning for ACS, but then was found to be a, a tension pneumothorax or something like that. And then you ultimately want to include the reason they're in the ICU and why they're still there. Then from there, you want to still follow the same SOAP format, which is the subjective objective assessment and plan format that you would do on normal floor patients. But it's going to be slightly different because the assessment and plan, you're going to break down by system that I broke, that I mentioned to you earlier. So now let's talk about the subjective part. When you have a uh, subjective part, you want to fo focus on how the patient is feeling today and the last 24 hour events that ended up happening. Did they have any sort of changes in their mental state? How are they feeling today compared to yesterday? And ultimately, what acute interventions were done in the last 24 hours that may explain why the patient is feeling better or worse? So that covers the subjective aspect. Now the objective aspect. The objective aspect, you can still go um, the same way you were doing on the floor. And the way you can do this is just by, first of all, listing the vitals, which is the most important, and then going into the physical exam. However, in the physical exam, you also still want to go by system. So you want to go by neuro, then cardiovascular, then um, and then pulmonary. But the good part is the physical exam is already broken down by system. So for the most part, you shouldn't have to change much. And then you can go into labs. 
Labs can be helpful here, and sometimes people will include the labs in the assessment and plan as well. The only reason to include the labs here is just to prime your audience when you're rounding to tell them the hemoglobin drop today or maybe the creatinine bump today, but you can actually formally discuss how you want to address that in your assessment and plan. The objective aspect is just to go over all of the lab values. So now you actually go to the hardest part, which is the assessment and plan. And you ultimately want to do all of this by system. So I figured I would actually walk you through a general assessment and plan presentation by system. Because now you're not going to go by specific problems that the patient has. You're instead going to go by system. So from a neurologic standpoint, you're going to say, neurologically, here are the things the patient has going on. And within the neuro segment, you can include the relevant problems. So for example, um, I will now present this patient, for example. From a neurological standpoint, there are two big things to always consider. One is sedation, and the second is pain. Any patient in the ICU, you should always know if you're giving them any sedating medications. And the second thing you should always know is how you're addressing their pain, because chances are they may be in a lot of pain. So for pain, you want to talk about how you're treating the patient's pain. Do you have any drips? Do you have any IV medications? And for sedations, you want to talk about, are they on any sedating drips? Are they on DEX? Are they on um, and uh, on propofol, a X, Y, or Z? Um, you also want to talk about their mental state. You know, have they been altered anytime uh, soon? Have they been altered because of an infection? Have they been altered because they're delirious? If they're delirious, are there any sort of precautions we're taking? And then the only other thing you might want to include in the neuro segment is any psych history they may have, because that may alter the way they're behaving. Now, let's go on to cardiology. So the next system you'll focus on is usually brain uh, cardiology, because that's in the chest, you often want to go over basic lab values, whether that's baseline creatinine numbers, because if you're diuresing them, creatinine will be helpful. You might also want to go over their BUN, because BUN often bumps before creatinine does when you're diuresing. The next thing you want to go over is, do they have a SWAN? A SWAN catheter is something that's often inserted into the, often from the internal jugular into the pulmonary artery to tell you the pulmonary artery pressures, the right ventricle pressures, the right atrium pressures. It can be a really good way to get the volume status of your patient. And also, if a patient has a SWAN, you can also measure their cardiac output. And for a lot of these cardiac patients who are in intensive care units, they often do have a SWAN and you can measure their cardiac output and ultimately how they're doing. If they're in cardiogenic shock, the cardiac output might be down, the SVR might be high, and ultimately their extremities might be very cool, right? So presenting this data can be helpful. The other thing I would also include within the cardiac section is if you are worried about cardiogenic shock, often mention what pressors they're on. Are they on norepinephrine? Are they on dobutamine? How much of those pressors are they on, right? And those are all things that can be very helpful to help understand the overall state of the patient's heart. The next thing is the respiratory status. You went over the heart. The next thing is the lungs. For any patient in the ICU, if they are on a ventilator, you always want to mention the date they were intubated, the size of the tube that they were getting, and then the vent settings that they were on, as well as their peak and plateau pressures. The peak pressure can be found on a ventilator, and oftentimes it's the peak pressure that a patient has when you give them a breath. And then afterwards, if you do an inspiratory hold, you can have a plateau pressure. And by having both of those, you can change you can actually gauge if there's any evidence of um, increased resistance in the airway. Um, the other respiratory issues you also want to include are, you know, any other respiratory concerns you have. Do you think they have ARDS? Do, they, do you think they have pneumonia? And within each of those hashtags, you want to talk about how you're addressing those things. But again, notice how you went over the respiratory as a system. Now you want to go over GI, right? We went over head, you know, ultimately went over cardiology, lungs, GI. Most patients in the ICU will often be fed either through TPN or tube feeds. If they're often intubated, you know, they're getting nutrition through an external source. So you want to talk about how many, how many tube feeds are they getting? Are they on GI prophylaxis? Are they getting normal bowel movements? If so, how, how often are their bowel movements? And then you also want to list any other relevant problems they have and address how you're addressing them as well. Now you want to go on to kidneys. That's called FENK. And the way you often do that is how much urine have they made in the last 24 hours? Are we concerned about decreasing urine output? Are we concerned about AKI based on creatinine? And ultimately, if these patients are on dialysis, whether that's hemodialysis or even peritoneal dialysis, when was their last session? Sometimes these patients in the ICU will often be on something called CRRT, which is more continuous renal replacement therapy. Um, that happens over 24 hours. It tends to be a bit more precise. Hemodynamics can come, uh, hemodialysis can often come with big swings in blood pressure. So most patients at the ICU might not get that because they're worried about hypotension. Um, and lastly, there's the heme ID standpoint. From a hematologic standpoint, most patients in the ICU might have anemia. So you want to make sure you're on top of their anemia. What is the cause of the anemia? 
from an infectious disease standpoint, when was their last infection? What antibiotics were they on? How long were they on antibiotics? This plays a very important role because down the road, you need to know if these patients are at risk for C. diff and ultimately if they're going to need vancomycin, right? Um, you also want to make sure you have a good idea of the night type of skin wounds these patients have. If they're in a bed for a long amount of time, they often get um, ulcers. Uh, they often get um, wound ulcers, sacral ulcers, sacral decubitus ulcers. So you want to make sure if they have any wounds, you're keeping an eye on that and wound care is following. And now, probably the most important thing I can tell you is you want to end every presentation with what's called as a bundle. A bundle is a summary of the patient and often encompasses things that are very, very table stakes for every ICU patient. What is their code status? Are they full code? Are they DNR, DNI? The sedation meds they're on. You want to make sure you're on top of any sedation meds they're on, just because if you're not, they might be getting something you're not aware of it. That would be a huge, huge mistake. The th third thing is GI prophylaxis. Most intubated patients are at risk of stress ulcers, so it's important to see if they're on GI prophylaxis. And then DVT prophylaxis is also important. The next thing is the diet. What kind of diet are they on? Are they getting tube fees, as we discussed? And lastly is the disposition. Are they going to stay in the ICU or are they going to be downgraded? And ultimately, if they're staying in the ICU, why are they staying? Lastly, I will mention any patient in the ICU will have a lot of lines. It is important for you to be aware of all the lines that they have, when they were placed, and the dates that they were placed. Because if they're in for too long, those often are a nidus of infection. So hopefully this now gave you a huge overview on how to approach ICU as an intern. It's very overwhelming, but this is a foolproof way to make sure you do not miss anything. And ultimately, see you succeed in front of everyone. So if you enjoyed this video, please drop a like, comment, share, subscribe. I appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next